Hey guys, Buildzoid here, and today we're going to be doing a spreadsheet video and looking at this here GTX uh, 7, uh, 770. Um, so yeah, this is a GTX 770 classified 4 gig, um, so it has 4 gigs of memory on it. Uh, I did not choose to buy this. So the way I ended up with this card is uh, basically I found a listing for a bunch of 7990s with water blocks for a decent price, and this was like a year ago or maybe even longer. Um, and this was a freebie that came with the 7990s. And the reason why this was a freebie that came with the 7990s is because this did not work. Um, so it was a dead card and the previous owner just wanted to get rid of it. And so, you know, it's like wh whoever buys the 7990s also get the gets this. Um, and so basically the problem this had when I got it, because it does work now, Though I won't be demonstrating that it works, because, uh, yeah, anyway, um, like, I didn't set up the, <laughs> the camera to, to show you the card running in a system, so, yeah, um, but basically the problem this card had when I got it, it, it had sort of two problems, but they're both related to the same, like, the, the cause of both issues is the same, so, uh, it would report insanely high power consumption figures, like, 600 watts plus, and it was power throttling like crazy, and, uh, yeah, so the power management was just all kinds of broken, and uh, it would also artifact like crazy. It was so tons of artifacting and totally broken power management. Initially, I thought, oh, I guess the power management is broken. And so I just desoldered the power monitoring circuitry, which stopped the thermal, like, which stopped the power throttling. It did not fix the artifacting. In fact, it made the artifacting way, way worse. Um, because now the card wasn't art, like, the card wasn't underclocking itself anymore. And so the instability was that much worse because of that. Um, so it turns out what the problem with this card was is that this actually seemed to have, like, core BGA damage, and I'm not 100% confident on that, but because basic, but basically, um, the, the thing is with, uh, any, any die, and actually, this is convenient, so here we have a, uh, a Vega die, um, that I pulled, like, th this one's dead, so, yeah, it's, it's not like, this is literally keychain parts at this point. Um, anyway, so this, uh, Vega die right here, um, you have obviously the substrate, right, and then on the back of it you have the BGA, so that's all, of, like, that's this ball grid array on the back, and then on the front of it you have the you know, silicon, and that connects to the substrate through a much, much, much smaller uh, FCBGA array. And so the interesting thing about the FCBGA is that can fail. Um, as far as I know, you can't reflow it, or at least it shouldn't really be reflowable, but you can thermal shock it. So putting a GPU in a freezer can sometimes fix broken FCBGA. Putting a GPU into, like, boiling water can fix broken FCBGA. Heating up a GPU to 100, like, a little around 100 degrees will potentially fix uh, damage in the connection between the silicon and the substrate. It will not fix uh, failed, like, the actual, like, substrate to PCB uh, BGA connection because... Um, well, th this one isn't, you know, microscopic, and therefore you can't just sort of thermal shock it back into alignment. You actually need to, uh, I, well, you can reflow this uh, back to life, which is not, you know, the best way of doing things, but it is an option. And then you can, of course, if you have the equipment and the skills, you can actually completely re redo the, the BGA where you pull off the chip, replace all the solder balls, put the chip back on. So I don't have the, the equipment to, to do a full, uh, like, reballing like that. But what I can do is I can reflow it, and that's where, <laughs> where the card got its new name of Toasted Edition. Um, so basically the way I reflowed this was, because, um, ba well, so in order to get this core off of a dead Vega, and I also have another, like, I have a lot of dead Vegas, so um, I have multiple cores, but... Uh, yeah, so basically, since I have, and I just generally have a lot of dead GPUs because of my bad purchasing habits, um, the the thing is, is, uh, like, for a, a long time, and then there's also all the GPUs I kill with, you know, like, screwed up vault molds and that kind of thing, which is, which is actually one of these cores is a dead Frontier Edition due to two vaults to the core, so, yeah. Anyway, um... Uh, so I basically have a collection of, of, like, I've been collecting, you know, GPU cores like that. 
And uh, over time, I've been trying to get my method of pulling the cores off better and faster. And the biggest problem I've always run into is, uh, like, I do have a hot air station, but it takes forever to pull off a GPU core, because especially on high-end GPUs, because high-end GPUs, you've got a massive ground plane, massive power planes. The, the whole thing acts like a giant heatsink. It takes forever before you get a core like uh, like and th then the other issue is is like getting all of the solder balls to melt at the same time with with just like a, a hot air rework station which really isn't meant for pulling entire chips like chips this big is just like yeah so that that sucks but i figured out a trick for that if i put the gpu on to above my toaster and then i turn on my toaster my toaster will actually happily spit out like 200 degree celsius air um, which is crazy hot. Like, toasters, as far as I know, shouldn't really go that high, but mine does. So I'm not sure why, but yeah, that's great. Like, because at 200 degrees, like, well, well, the main concern with that is, is I'm actually kind of worried using that toaster that I might, like, have components drop off the back of the card. And it shouldn't be too much of an issue for, like, lighter components, but it's still kind of like, I don't really, like, I want to reflow the front, not the back. You know, I don't really want the uh, back of the card g getting all runny, but the solder should, with just surface tension, hold all the components in place as long as they're not too heavy. But still, so the toaster gets really, really hot. And so with the toaster heating up the basically acting as a hot plate for the GPU, except it's more like a, a second, you know, hot air station. Um, yeah, it heats up the PCB to like 200 degrees very, very quickly. And then the hot air only has to heat up the, the chip another like 30 degrees because uh, consumer electronics are all done entirely in lead-free solder. There are some exceptions for that, like automotive stuff, I think, is allowed to use leaded solder. And, you know, like critical, like life-critical stuff is allowed to use leaded. But um, the consumer electronics, no. Uh, so all of this is lead free and th therefore the melting point is anywhere between 215 degree, well, no, 217 up to uh, uh, 227 degrees. So basically 230. And the thing is, so with the PCB getting heated up by the toaster, the ho like I only need to heat up the core on the front a little bit. And that means I can get all of the solder balls to like melt uh, at the same time, which is... Like, this chip right here is, I think, the best pull I've ever done for a GPU core. Because, like, a lot of the early pulls I've done is, like, I'd shred the, the beat. Like, I'd rip up memory traces and that kind of thing. And, yeah, this thing's really clean. Except for the part where the chip is dead. But, yeah, it's, it's really, like, this is a really clean pull. So, I'm really happy with that one. Anyway, so, once I figured out that the toaster works amazingly well for pulling cores, um, it also works really well for, for reflowing. Um, for the same reason, because the only difference is like now, instead of, you know, pulling the chip off when I see all the solder balls have melted, I can just kind of let it cool back down to room temperature. So that's what I did with the 770. Then I rebuilt it and I put it in the system and bam, it works. And also I no longer had any of the power monitoring circuitry. So this doesn't have a power limit, which is pretty fun. Um, so yeah, so that's how I fixed it. It has no power limit. I will show you how I did the whole no power limit. So if you have a 770 or a 680 classified, because uh, this actually is just a GTX 680 classified 4 gig with, with a different heat sink. And like, I'm not sure if they had a backplate on the previous versions, but yeah, this doesn't have a backplate. Um, anyway, so yeah, that's how I fixed the card. And that's why it's called the Toasted Edition, because it's the first card that I've ever repaired using my toaster. Um, Oh, and also the color correction on the camera is great. Yeah, so this go turns yellow. So it's not actually this yellow in person. Because if I flip the card over, you can see that the white balance changes. Over time. I, I need to lock it in to be white balanced to this, but whatever. Um, so, yeah. Um... Now, on the back, you can see I've added some extra capacitors because uh, basically the main reason I actually ended up repairing this card is because I have a GTX 770 Lightning that I also repaired. And then I did a bunch of oscilloscope testing on that card and I was like, ooh, I wonder how a, you know, like a GTX 770 Lightning's VRM compares to other really high-end GTX 770s and potentially GTX 680s as well because I have, I have one, I think I have one GTX 680. 
I'll have to check, but I'm pretty sure I only have one of those. Um, anyway, so, yeah, I only have one 680. There's no, yeah, definitely only have one 680. So, anyway, um, yeah, so I wanted to compare my Lightning against some other high-end cards to see, you know, how the voltage regulation compares, and, and this is a great candidate for that because that is a beast of a V-Core output filter. Um, and then I did my testing, and I was like, well, I'm bored, and when I'm bored... I attach capacitors to things because the the thing is basically um, in my testing I was like the the results I got in my testing was like oh the the lightning actually does a little bit better and I was like I wonder if I can get the same effect like if I could DIY um, sort of well yeah pretty much DIY the effect of the GPU core reactor that the the lightning has so the lightning comes with a little add-on board that plugs in right behind the core and it's just a bunch of extra capacitors and it actually makes a small but measurable effect it does have a small but measurable effect on uh voltage regulation and, and the thing with the uh, Kepler and the voltage regulation is Kepler has a uh, 13 megahertz core clock increments so if you improve the voltage regulation by 10 millivolts it's probably not going to do anything you need like a 20 millivolt voltage regulation improvement before you're going to notice an improvement in terms of clock speed because your next clock speed step is 13 megahertz right um, so so that's kind of annoying with Kepler cards but it's still you know workable um, and yeah, so that's what happened with these extra capacitors over here in terms of the capacitors that I've used. And this is not, in fact, equivalent. The, the capacitor configuration I have here is not equivalent to a GPU core reactor. Uh, a GPU core reactor is four, is eight 470 microfarad capacitors, uh, the SMD aluminum polymer type. And uh, this is four through-hole aluminum polymers and three SMD aluminum polymers. So this is like... And the funny thing is, I did build a, like, because I scrapped one of my GPU, I have two, oh, actually, no, I do have a GTX 680, I have a GTX 6, other, I have a 4 gig 680 FTW, and then I have a 682 gig Lightning, there, I, 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 I do have two of them, I'm dumb, anyway, um, so, uh, yeah, that was, anyway, back to this, um, this video is turning out really badly. I'm very sorry, guys. Um, so, the thing is, the, the core reactor in... So, I built a second... Like, so, basically, I scrapped one of my GPU core reactors um, because, basically, I was wondering, like, would it be better to... You should just watch the other video, you know? That would make life so much easier. There's another video I did with the... Actually, wait, does that video include the fat reactor? Or did I only ever show that on a live stream? Oh, man. I'm not pulling... Oh, and I, I put that card in storage. Yeah, no, we're not going to take a look at that. Anyway, um, but due to some some further testing I did with the GPU core reactors, I figured out that basically these 1,200 microfarad caps are, like, one of them is roughly equivalent to a single one of the 470 uh, SMD caps as, uh, as uh, like, in terms of the impact that they have on voltage regulation. So... Basically, this isn't really an entire GPU core reactor, because we do have four of the 1200 microfarad caps, but only three of the 470s. So this is like seven-eighths of a GPU core reactor, and not even really. And the main reason why the 1200 microfarad caps are so much worse for uh, filtering, you know, right behind a GPU core is like these have much more ESL. Um, and actually, they also have slightly more ESR than the SMD capacitors. So basically, like, sure, they can store significantly more energy. They're also just worse at releasing and storing that energy very quickly. So, yeah. And with GPU cores, like, the thing we're trying to filter here is very, very rapid switching noise from, from the silicon. So, yeah, these, these aren't ideal for this application. But the thing is, they're actually, like, the 1200 microfarad uh, through-hole caps are significantly cheaper than the SMD 470s. So, you know, it's just like... And since they're roughly the same, like, the impact is roughly the same, it's like, it's not really, like, I, I, I'm i cool with using them there. So, um, yeah, so I messed around with that, and it does have a small effect, but it's not as much of an effect as I was hoping for, and at this point, let's pull off the cooler and take a look at the um, power monitoring circuitry, or the lack of, well, it, the thing is, there's not that, like, well, it's just the brain part of the power monitoring circuitry that's missing, also, I guess I should address the memory chips on the back of the card. So, 
with uh, with GDDR5, like you might be looking at this and be like, oh, is this like dual rank for, for GDDR5? No, it isn't. Me GDDR memory uses a completely different method of getting more memory chips onto the same uh, size memory controller. And the trick that they use is basically the memory chips are configurable. Uh, configurable, So you can run them in 16x mode or you can run them in 32-bit. Uh, so 16-bit mode or 32-bit mode. And normally you have 32-bit wide memory chips. But here, um, because we have memory chips both on the front and the back, this is called the clamshell mode because the chips are clamshelling around the PCB. Um, they run in 16, uh, they run 16 bit width. So there's no performance benefit from having, uh, well, there's no intrinsic performance benefit from having m more memory chips. Um, you do have the benefit if you have a workload that needs three gigs of VRAM, well, it fits onto the card. Whereas if you had a two gig card, it, it like one gig of data would be sitting in like system memory. And anytime the card wants to access that, it has to go through the PCIe slot to the CPU, get it from the, and that takes forever and torpedoes your frame rate. So, um, but there is no, like, but if you have a, like a one gig workload, a four gig card is not going to be any faster than a two gig card because there's no difference in, in the actual band, like in the effective bandwidth. Um, so yeah. So that's just something that you should know about GDDR memory systems is that clamshell mode really doesn't do it. Like it doesn't do anything for performance other than like if you need a lot of memory, then yeah, it, it helps then. But if you don't need a lot of memory, it doesn't do anything. So here we get to see the absolute, like the, the thing is, like the main reason why I wanted to compare the classified to the lightning is this is a way bigger output filter than what the lightning has so i'm actually really surprised that the lightning was doing so well but again it's like msi literally decided to just whack capacitors right behind the core whereas you know evga has a very elaborate output filter but this is what we're trying to filter and this is where our filter is and it's like eh, distance bad um but yeah we have a lot of smd aluminum polymer capacitors and then we have of course the, the through hole uh, aluminum polymer capacitors behind that and then on the back of the card, we just have more of the same. This right here is for the memory, and the same goes over here. Like these three caps over here, that's for the memory, and this is all for the memory. So, yeah, but this is still a very, very substantial output filter. Also, this VRM is not even really meant for GTX 680s. Uh, NVIDIA originally, I mean, EVGA originally had this VRM on the GTX 580. It's also on GTX 780 classifieds, 780 Ti classified, 780 Ti kingpins, uh, GTX 980 Ti classifieds, GTX 1080 classifieds, and that's the last time they used this VRM, the 1080 classified. So, um, yeah, a beast of a VRM, <laughs> but, um, um, yeah, so, there. So, kind of, a, like, a really cool VRM, but also a rather, like, uh, EVGA likes copy-pasting it around, and it makes sense. Like, if you have a perfectly good VRM, why would you design a new one? Um, but, uh, yeah, I think the main difference between the, the light, like this and the lightning is that I think the lightning technically might have more of the SMD uh, aluminum polymers, and the lightning is also a true 8 phase, whereas this is a 14 phase with doublers. I don't think that really does anything. I think the lightning might actually run a higher stock switching frequency. So, um, but before we, like, we need to look at the results. Um, so out of, co like, without the context of the spreadsheet, this, everything I'm saying probably, uh, well, for a lot of people, even with the spreadsheet, it won't make any sense, but, you know, <laughs> for, the, for those who understand the spreadsheet, it'll add some much-needed context. So, um, the, the current monitoring thing. Let's move the card over, and I think I got it relatively centered, so let's zoom in. And I overdid it. So, um, normally on this PCB, this, like, there'd be a chip right here, there'd be a chip right there, and there'd be a chip right here. And, well, mine doesn't have those chips because those chips are INA219s, which is like the little brother of the INA3221. And on uh, GPUs in the, like, 500, 600, 700, 900 series, if you literally just remove the current monitoring chip, 
uh, the card doesn't have a power limit anymore. Now, you can't do that on the 10 series, which has very recently come to my attention, because if you do that on the 10 series, they get stuck in safe mode, which is super annoying. But on older cards, you can literally just remove the current monitoring chips, and I would recommend that you don't throw them out and that you be gentle removing them so that it, on the off chance that I'm wrong, because again, I don't know everything, there might be some card that for some bizarre reason manages to trip safe mode anyway, but generally it shouldn't, from my understanding, um, but you should still like, you know, like, I, I would not recommend remove like, th this is definitely... Like, this is a method I'm very happy to use, mostly because I've gotten good enough with the hot air, re like, hot air station that I'm very confident replacing something like this. Um, if you don't have a hot air station, I would generally not recommend just pulling off your current monitoring chips, because getting them back on is going to be borderline impossible. Um, so, yeah. But with this card, and because it is my card, I just pulled them off, and so now it doesn't have a power limit. So that's how that works. And I guess, well, there's actually a couple more things that I could point out. So the thermal paste that I'm using, it's blue, it's Kingpin Cooling KPX, great thermal paste. It's primarily meant for liquid nitrogen, but it also works really, really well at ambient. Um, and uh, other than that, right, so that's actually everything I've done to the card. You know, the funny thing is, I'm still considering adding more capacitors. Like, <laughs> I'm still still toying with that idea. But uh, anyway, the other thing that I've done, and I'm not uh, not the artwork, loosely, you know, artwork on on the shroud. Uh, no, the other thing that I've done to the to the card is actually these heat sinks from EVGA are the fins at the end are really loose and actually like. You can still, so yeah, you, you can see these fins are still pretty loose. And this is super annoying because basically if you max out the fan speed on this card, this end of the heatsink just starts to rattle. And one of the workarounds that I've been sort of using for that is because they have these holes in put into the fins for like uh, extra, like to allow air to travel through the fin stack better. Um, if you just put a, like a screw into those holes, you can sort of fix the fins together and they'll be like, they'll be much less loose and therefore much like they won't rattle around so much. So that's the other thing that I've done to this card. And I also have that on my 780 Ti. Like this is a thing that I do with a lot of the classified coolers because basically they all rattle. Like this is super annoying. Um, and it's not a big deal if you're, if you're, you know, at normal fan speeds, but for benchmarking, I normally max out the fan speed and it's just obnoxious to have like the fan the 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 noise of the fans i can live with but the heatsink like rattling around because there's loose fins in it is just i find that really really annoying so that takes care of that now we can finally take a look at the spreadsheet oh my god how did i how did i spend 20 minutes getting to the spreadsheet well hopefully we don't spend that long on the spreadsheet so here is the lovely spreadsheet um, so here we have the test results from the lightning it, with with the reactor the lightning is doing one point like the, these are the important numbers this over here is just like okay that's neat to look at but it doesn't actually matter that much so these are the important values so with the reactor the lightning is doing 1.14 uh, minimum voltage and uh, like on average like the average we should just pull up the image Ta-da! So here's what a Firestrike uh, graphics, I think this is GT1. So this is what Firestrike GT1 running looks like. Um, and basically you can actually see that the noise pattern is repeating and it's like, that is actually, like it's created by the frame render cycle of the GPU. So as the GPU goes through a frame render, the voltage like s spikes up and down based on the GPU not pulling a consistent amount of current. Um, and so it repeats every single time there's a, like every time a frame gets rendered, it repeats some kind of noise pattern like this. So that's why it's repeating. And you can actually like count the FPS from the oscilloscope using this, which is kind of neat. But anyway, um, so the statistics that I'm mostly tracking here is uh, the uh, minimum voltage, like the average minimum voltage, which is like how low the, sp like, 
uh, over the course of the run, the average minimum voltage, and then also the absolute minimum voltage. So like the lowest of the low spikes throughout the entire fire strike run, I track that. And then I track also the average, uh, like how low the spikes are on average. Um, so yeah, and other than that, I also track peak to peak and the average voltage. So that's sort of all of the things that, you know, I'm tracking in my data. And so the lightning is getting 1.14 minimum average and worst case minimum 1.12. And this is with the GPU core reactor. So that's with all of the extra capacitors behind the core. And that's the, the stock lightning because there's the, then we have like the fat reactor, the BZ, and there's the buildzoid edition where I basically just went absolutely to town on the card with extra capacitors. Uh, anyway, so, you know, stock with the reactor, 1.14, 1.12. Um, without the reactor, we're getting 1.13, 1.11. Now, if you look at a bone stock classified, it runs 1.12, 1.09. So this is actually like significantly worse. That's 20 millivolts. So basically, and the thing is the chips on both of the cards are not the same. Um, as in like the quality of the silicon of the cores on each of these 770s is not the same. Um, and the funny thing is they actually top out roughly at the same clocks on at least air cooling, but the sevens of the classified it seems to be pulling way more power. So that chip seems to be significantly leakier. Now at stock voltage, like at 1.2 volts, that's much less, like the, the difference in power draw with the cards at 1.2 volts is much smaller than at like 1.38. But uh, yeah, so that might be slightly throwing off the data. Um, and I'm hoping it's not too much of a problem, but either way, the, the classified on stock settings is, is about 30 millivolts worse in worst case scenario, 20 millivolts worse on average. Um, and that would actually, you know, potentially translate to if the silicon quality between the cards was the same, uh, on stock settings, the classified would probably clock maybe an entire 13 megahertz worse. Um, so that's not great. But the classified, unlike the lightning, does have the classified controller utility. Um, which allows you to change the VRM switching frequency. And if you just max the switching frequency out to 571 kilohertz, um, which might not necessarily be completely like which might not be completely necessary, but I'm lazy and I didn't feel like testing every single step between 260 and 571 kilohertz, so I just maxed it out. Um, that immediately gets us basically to the same performance level as like, it, it's sort of in between a lightning with the reactor and the lightning without the reactor. Cause we have the minimum, like average minimums of without the reactor, but the minimum minimum of with the reactor. So that massively improves the voltage regulation. Um, and uh, yeah, but we're still losing on the peak to peak. And I, I like the, the thing is, I'm just going to say that's just a distribution of capacitance thing going on there because with the GPU core reactor, the lightning has something like, like 4,000 microfarads of capacitance sitting right behind the core and the classified, like it doesn't have that. Like it might have more capacitance in total, but most of that capacitance is sitting, you know, very far away from the core and I'm measuring right behind the GPU core. And I forgot to talk about where I measured from. Yay! I'm not reshooting this video. I've reshot this video way too many times. But, so the measuring point is right here. Like these two capacitors right here, I measured on this card and also on the lightning. I measured from the exact same two capacitors on both cards because if you measure from a different capacitor, you're going to get a me different measurement. And like, there, you know what's also really annoying? Some cards will actually have different uh, capacitors sitting behind the core. Like, not these two, but I think some Asus cards will actually replace the uh, capacitors. Actually, I'm not sure if it, if Asus does that specifically, but there are some cards where the, the back of core capacitors will be replaced with, like, like these are 10 microfarads, but sometimes you'll get cards with 47 microfarad caps, um, and then it's just like, yeah, you try to measure off of those, and you're going to get a different measurement than if you're measuring off of 10s. So that's like, eh, that's, that's not great. Um... Anyway, back to the spreadsheet. So, um, the biggest problem with the classified is basically on stock settings, it doesn't run the very high switching frequency. Um, at 260 kilohertz, we're back down to 1.09 volts. So yeah, like the, the switching frequency is very much like the main thing affecting this. And the funny thing is, um, with the classified controller, as soon as you start messing with that, it kind of changes, like it seems to change the behavior of the VRM a little bit 
which is why even though, you know, like 260 kilohertz and the same average voltage, here we're getting like slightly better results for GT2. So that's graphics test two is getting slightly better worst case minimums. But for some reason, the peak to peak, like the thing is 10, 10 millivolts peak to like worst case scenario, peak to peak has got worse, but on average, the peak to peak is about the same. So yeah, uh, basically no difference. So 260 kilohertz is the same as stock, but there's a bit of a, like maybe slight voltage configuration difference there. Anyway, then we have the Buildzoid Edition configuration, which I should really rename that to the Toaster Edition. But uh, anyway, um, so this is with the extra capacitors that I added. And so the extra capacitors made a huge difference at 260 kilohertz switching frequency. Like I literally took it from losing like, like, well, basically that's a 20 millivolt improvement right there. So that's significant. That's a big gain. Um, and then at 571 kilohertz, we're now matching, like the card is now matching the lightning on average, but it's not beating it. Like it's not any better on the mi worst case scenario minimum. So, which is fine. Like, honestly, like I, that, that's uh, especially considering that I only added like seven capacitors in total, whereas the lightning, like, I think when I was finished with the lightning, it had, so it had all eight of the capacitors from the reactor. Then it had an entire extra, well, the thing is there's like the, the, the reactor SLI configurations where it's just like, so not only, um, so the reactor SLI configurations is like, so we have eight, like we have the entire capacity, like all of the caps from the reactor are now soldered to the, to the card. Then I've also added a bunch of 22 microfarad cap, like just a bunch of random small multilayer ceramics under the reactor. And then there's also the big fat reactor, which is like a, uh, which that's a 9,600 microfarad reactor, um, which you can see that it's actually losing to the reactor made with the SMD capacitors because SMD capacitors are just ridiculously overpowered when you're trying to filter very high frequency noise, um, like say a GPU cores, you know, transients. Um, so yeah, through hole through hole capacitors suck. <laughs> Um, even if they're like huge, like the, 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 like my reactor is almost three times the capacitance of the lightning, like the, the MSI reactor. And it's just like, yeah. And it's, it's not even close to winning on voltage regulation. Um, but still, so, um, yeah, I basically got the classified very, very close to the behavior of the, of the lightning. And admittedly, this is a, a lower average voltage and the thing is, like, as I kept tweaking the reactor configuration, like, or more like as I kept messing with the capacitor configuration, the average voltage on the lightning went down and the classified really didn't do that. So I'm not really sure what's up with that, but yeah. Um, so technically speaking, like the aver the gap between the average and the minimum here is better than it is here, but they're still like, this is what, this is 90 millivolts versus, well, that's... It's actually significant. I guess I do need to add more capacitors to the classified. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, I might have to do that. But uh, anyway, so yeah, I, I just found like th this is one of those things that I, I just find interesting is just like uh, testing the, the voltage regulation performance between the two cards. Like I'm still really surprised that the lightning was is doing better than the classified because i really thought this right here has to do a better job than you know just tacking some extra capacitors right behind the core but i guess the location matters a lot um and there might also be some differences in like the actual like voltage controller configuration and that kind of thing though they do both use the same controllers like this is a chl8318 the lightning is a chl8318 um, but this is a 14 phase, whereas that's an eight. Um, and there might be like inductor uh, differences that I didn't account for. But like, I really thought all of these extra multilayer ceramics would do something, like would, would translate to like better performance. But um, yeah, it do doesn't seem like it. Anyway, um, they're both really, really close. And then there's also the fact that this card does seem to pull more power, which could be the memory chips. Like the thing is, I didn't really try too hard to isolate which which was pulling what so basically from a scientific stand like from a scientific method standpoint my scientific method here sucks like is really bad 
<laughs> I didn't really do a great job of isolating all the variables, but I don't know. I might do a little bit of retesting with this. The main thing is, though, like, what I mostly want to do with the cards right now is just, like, run them together in SLI and then take, like, take them on some more extreme cooling. Because they, like, especially this card is super limited by the air cooler. Like, at 1.38 volts, this thing is hitting the thermal throttle point, which is insane. The lightning doesn't hit the thermal throttle. Also an interesting thing, this card scores slightly higher in 3D Mark than the lightning does. Um, but I think that just might be down to the way I was running the memory on both of the cards, because when I was running the lightning, I decided to just go from max... Like, I, I was really pushing the memory clock as high as it could go, and that's not necessarily the best way, like the best thing for your overall performance because the higher you push your memory, you start getting like errors that the GPU might try to correct and then you start losing performance from that. Then also as you increase memory clock, there are memory timing straps and I'm pretty sure like this card doesn't go over two gigahertz memory at all. Like it just doesn't do that. Whereas the lightning, I got that over two gigahertz memory clock and I think the problem with that is, and I think that actually costs the Lightning some performance at this point, because normally the memory timing straps are every tw uh, every 250 megahertz. Um, and so going over, um, and I don't know if this is true for NVIDIA, but on AMD cards, it's normally every 250 megahertz you get a new timing strap. So going from like, so it, it basically from like 1750 megahertz all the way to two gigahertz, you'll have... Um, one timing strap. And so you'll have the best performance at like 1995 megahertz. 1995 megahertz is going to be faster than 2005 because 2005 megahertz is on the looser two gigahertz memory timing strap. It also means that 1995 is probably going to be less stable. So that, that's one of those things, like it, like weird things with, with GPU overclocking that you, you need to account for. And yeah, I didn't really account for that when testing the Lightning, so basically I need to run these cards more. Um, but both of them do 1400 plus core clock on air cooling, which is pretty cool. Um, like this does 1420, the Lightning does 1420, the Lightning does 1420 with much less complaining than this does. Um, but yeah, so bo both of these cards like are, like I'm really happy that I revived this thing, because now I can also run them in SLI. Um, and... Yeah, so that's it for the video. Um, that's the GTX 770, and I'm actually going to reapply the thermal paste. I've taken this card apart so many times because of all of the reshoots of this video that we are going to redo the thermal paste. Actually, I think I can just use the thermal paste that's already on there because I tend to use a lot of thermal paste, just general, so I'm going to grab that. Oh, wait, nope, it's all... Now somebody's going to be like, you're just making the video longer for no reason. Yeah, no, this thermal paste is all dried up. You know what? Let's just end the video here. I'm, I'm going to reapply the thermal, re redo the thermal paste off camera. So anyway, yeah, thank you for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comment section below. If you'd like to support what I do here with actually hardcore overclocking, I have a Patreon. There's a link to that down in the description below. Uh, it goes towards things like this. Um, and then there's also the HOC Teespring store where you can pick up shirts, stickers, posters, and other YouTube, you know, the usual YouTuber merch stuff. Um, and that also goes towards things like this and other things, you know, but things like this. Um, anyway, so yeah, that's it for the video. Thanks for watching and goodbye.